can find out how NASA is using games to help kids concentrate. And we step into the ring with our review of Knockout Kings. And we pay homage to the golden age of Sega. Stick around. It's gaming time. Hello and welcome to Extended Play from Metreon in San Francisco. I'm Adam Sessler. And I'm Kate Patello. Now, we all might joke from time to time that gamers have classically short attention spans. Mm -hmm. But what if games could actually help you focus? Recent studies at NASA have actually found a link between developing concentration skills and gaming. This research could mean a lot to people with attention deficit disorder. Dude. Oh, yeah. Can video games help you concentrate and relax? NASA scientists seem to think so. NASA Langley Research in Hampton, Virginia completed a new study last year. The experiment used video games to help kids with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. Attention Deficit Disorder is associated with uh, problems with uh, paying attention. Uh, uh, often there is also a hyperactivity problem. Uh, uh, there is difficulty completing tasks. The study used a form of biofeedback technology that has been around for years. Most recently it's been used to train pilots. The video game biofeedback idea came out of our research in flight deck human factors. We were interested in the problem of pilots becoming disengaged, uninvolved with what's going on. It occurred to us the simulator could be replaced by a video game because simulators are essentially very sophisticated video games. Patients in the study were hooked up to biofeedback devices that monitored their brain waves as they played video games. The way the video game biofeedback system works is that a child who's playing a video game is also connected to brainwave monitors and those brainwave monitors send control signals to the video game controller that they have in their hands. The signal that comes from the brainwave processing uh, equipment influences the controller by making it more or less responsive, giving the uh, uh, player control over steering or taking it away. The games that we found this works best with are games that have a smooth forward flow, like racing games, car racing, skateboard racing, those kinds of things. You have to have total control over the character or the other people that you're racing are going to beat you. Mitch Hayner has ADHD and took part in the NASA study. And I got a note from the teacher that said that Mitch did all of his work standing on one leg with one leg in his chair. And then in one day she took away his scissors, his ruler, and his pencil sharpener, so I figured we needed some help. We did medication and that definitely helped, but I didn't want him to be dependent on that. And I wanted him to be able to recognize um, when he was out of control. And so we looked at um, um, biofeedback. At the beginning, it took me a while just to get used to it. And once I got used to it and got like started trying to relax a lot more than I was, it got easier, a lot easier really, because I could control my character. Other psychologists are starting to acknowledge the potential benefits of using video game-based therapy. While they have difficulty paying attention in class, when you put them in front of a video game, they're there and they're focusing. So um, if you can find out what is at the essence of uh, some of the gaming features that, that attracts and maintains their attention, and then try to develop uh, tools that can provide useful learning in that same manner, um, then you might be onto something. The patients in the NASA study showed good results from this procedure. It made me focus and like concentrate on what I'm doing. And when I'm doing my homework, I have to concentrate and know what I'm doing so I don't write like a wrong answer or forget to do a question. So now, I, before I would always forget like a question or do something like that, and now I don't. I get all my homework done quicker too. Being aware of it and being able to control himself will help him. Um, be able to function better. What we did with this technology is not mind control in the sense that people usually understand mind control. What we've done is to train children to control their own minds, to be able to control the connection between their minds and bodies simply by playing video games.
interesting to see what happens if this technology makes it to the consumer market. You'd have peripherals at home that integrate biofeedback into gameplay. Now that is immersion. Now say you had a game where you had to drive really fast. Now you have to do that plus cultivate a zen state and stay calm all at the same time. That's a big challenge. Yes, especially for me. Yeah. Now here's the game news. Sega of America is suing Kmart for failing to pay for Dreamcast consoles supplied to the chain since September of 1999. Sega claims that Kmart still owes $2.2 million of their bill. Reports claiming that Kmart halted sales of the Dreamcast in August are incorrect. Sega discontinued shipments of the console to the retail chain last July due to past due payments. The Associated Press reports that Oregon State Senator Ken Masurl is sponsoring legislation that would prohibit arcade owners from allowing minors to play gory games. Penalties for violators are a year in jail and or a $5,000 fine. Should this bill pass, it may set a precedent for other states to follow. LucasArts has announced the development of Star Wars real-time strategy games in a partnership with Ensemble Studios, the creators of the Age of Empires series. The initial release from this venture, Star Wars Battleground, will be built using Ensemble's proprietary engine, and the game is expected to be released in the fall. A Lion Head spokesperson has confirmed that Peter Molyneux's Black and White is finally finished. Although the title is complete, it is not expected to launch for another month. Coming up on Extended Play, we go to a galaxy far, far away in our review of Star Wars Starfighter. Welcome back to Extended Play from Metreon in San Francisco. So have you ever gone to the car dealership for a test drive and been tempted to just take the car out on the freeway and gun it as fast as it'll go? No, but you can actually have that experience with Bizarre Creation's interesting twist on the racing game, Metropolis Street Racer. Three, two, one, go! Tearing around a race course and sliding through an S-curve in a finely tuned racing machine is quite fun, but it's also available in tons of racing titles. Metropolis Street Racer offers a different driving experience. Here you have to take high-speed turns in cars that can be bought at your local dealer, all the while trying to avoid those pesky keep left signs. The three cities of San Francisco, Tokyo and London play host to over 250 courses and the environments are filled with signs, statues of famous dead people and other landmarks. Weather and time of day effects are well done. The varying rain conditions are appropriately damp and early morning races have a steely blue chill. Over 40 cars from Mitsubishi to Mercedes are available, and each car is unique in control, so players can find a car suitable to their driving style. And it's all about style. While it's pretty easy to achieve the time goals in each race, doing so without panache will keep you from progressing through the 25 chapters in the game. Sound-wise, the most impressive aspect of the game is the radio. This is newcomer Shanice Williams' first entry. Each city has three different stations, complete with DJs, commercials, and static as you pass through tunnels. From country to techno, MSR ensures that if you don't like the music, you can change the station. MSR takes the racing game to a new level and new location. The solid graphics and gameplay make for hours of entertainment which is why Extended Play gives Metropolis Street Racer a 4 out of 5. Now let's take it off the streets and into the sky. We recently spent some time with the publishers at LucasArts who were responsible for getting Star Wars Starfighter off the ground. Believe us though, they had nothing to worry about. Star Wars Starfighter for the PlayStation 2 leaves all other console space combat games in the dust with its impressive graphics, play control, and varied challenges. They're on me. I can't shake them. Star Wars Starfighter is a mission-based game that takes place during the events in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. As Naboo pilot in training Reese Dallows, space pirate Nim, okay. and gun for hire Vanna Sage, either you take me with you or you shoot me. Players pilot a variety of distinctive ships. There are 14 missions to defend Naboo against the Trade Federation. Regardless of which ship you pilot, the game makes excellent use of the PlayStation 2 controller. Throughout each mission, voiceovers as well as radar will let you know what you should be doing at almost any given point in combat. The dialogue also gives the game a sense of urgency. Bravo 10, engaging fighters. After a mission or objective is completed, there are cutscenes which give the game a cinematic feel and move the story along. Okay, okay, calm down. 
The gameplay looks as good as the cutscenes. Missions over bright lava, subdued deserts, and rolling green hills are impressive with a sleek, pseudo-realistic look. Starfighter looks excellent and should impress even the most jaded gamer. Star Wars Starfighter is one of the first truly great games on the PlayStation 2. Fans of space combat will definitely enjoy it, and the learning curve makes it accessible to the casual gamer. In short, this is an almost essential PS2 game. Extended play gives Star Wars Starfighter an absolutely stellar 5 out of 5. Coming up on Extended Play, gothic horror abounds in our review of Clive Barker's Undying. And we step into the ring in Knockout Kings 2001. Welcome back to Extended Play at Metreon in San Francisco. Clive Barker is without a doubt one of the modern masters of horror. So knowing that he participated on this next game makes it sound very promising. It's Clive Barker's Undying. Who dares enter my realm uninvited? Set in Ireland in the 1920s, Undying Cashew is Patrick Galloway, an expert in the occult who must investigate the unpleasant goings-on at an old buddy's estate. While the involvement of Clive Barker would promise a rich story, the narrative doesn't evolve to the level of No One Lives Forever or Deus Ex, and much of it is told through journal entries, which require more reading than one may like. But these faults are made up for in the perpetual sense of dread conveyed throughout the game. The atmospherics make turning corners and looking into mirrors a harrowing experience. Despite the horror trappings, Undying is still essentially a shooter. Levels are varied but stay quite linear with locked doors keeping you on the right path. Stuck. Yet the large scope of most levels keeps you from always feeling led around. The gameplay does provide a twist to the genre with Patrick able to fire weapons with his left hand and perform spells with his right, offering new strategies for disposing of enemies. The game truly excels in its visuals and uses the Unreal Engine to stunning effect. The variety of enemy animations helps make the game a visual feast. The game's sound is sublime and hinting at the horrors to come, although the voice acting has its problems. I know it is around here someplace. Despite not having a multiplayer option, Undying is still easy to recommend to those that yearn for a long, intense, fright-filled action fest. Extended play gives Undying a 4 out of 5. By the way, for the full spookification factor, make sure you play Undying alone in the dark. Boxing was a really popular gaming genre, especially back in the day of Mike Tyson's punch-out for the NES. Now, though, boxing is making a resurgence, so let's see what happens with Knockout Kings 2001 for the PS2. Get it Yes, boxing fans, the rumors are true. After many a dry year, there is finally a game worthy to the sport that has shocked and inspired millions. PlayStation 2's Knockout Kings 2001 has brought boxing back to the mainstream with its varied game modes, fantastic graphics, and realistic, sometimes brutal fighting. First, pick the professional boxer you wish to pound your opponent with. Choices range from the legendary Muhammad Ali and Jack Dempsey to new singing sensation, the golden boy, Oscar De La Hoya. Down for the count. If none of these champs ring your bell, head over to career mode and create your very own boxer. Assign him or her boxing shorts, skill level, nickname, and a real-life trainer. After a little punching of the bag, you'll be ready to hit the ring in no time. The graphics are great. The muscles, the skin tone, the facial structures. These boxers look real. The sound is also excellent. The announcers are intelligent and offer insight into what is actually happening in the ring. Look at him just baiting him with a free shot. Not exactly sure how that missed. As for the punches, there's a satisfying thump that lets you know when your gloved hand strikes home. The only sound missing is the voice of the actual boxer. As he ropes the dope, Ali should be yelling, I'm the greatest of all time. Instead, he stares silently into space. Oh well, something to work on for the next game. All in all, Knockout Kings 2001 is the most entertaining boxing game to come along in quite some time, as well as being the best looking one ever. Extended play gives it a smashing 4 out of 5.
here. Wow, he goes down again. This one is all over. Coming up on Extended Play, we harken back to simpler times in our homage to Sega. And Terry Jackson from the San Francisco 49ers gives us his tips for playing Madden 2001.